So the first thing, all right, so the main, really the only thing we're gonna talk about tonight is IDA Pro. This is the thing I put off for a while because I said at first people find this quite daunting and I think my hope is that after you've used Ollie for a few weeks and gotten used to looking at assembly code a little, this will be less daunting. But it still presents you with a lot of information. And as usual, I, I want to emphasize I'm only covering a little bit of it here, even less than your textbook. We're doing like the first one third of the project. project gives you, the textbook gives you one project, and we're going to do the first one third of that project, and then some more easier projects from CTF. Just so you had some practice with this tool, this tool is very deep, worth two or three classes on its own. People pay $5,000 for the pro version and become an expert at using it, and then that's all they do is stare at this thing all day long. And then there's serious reverse engineering, and it's an interesting career. But it's very deep, and we're not going to, they're just uh, getting the start of it here. So Ollie had, the pay version is very expensive, but there are two free versions. There's an old, there is an older free version and a newer free version, and we're using the older one here for no particular reason. They, there's various free versions, and both free versions support x86. The newer versions support x64 and other kinds of processors, and they support, they recognize common library code too, using this flirt database, which just recognizes known libraries to give it the right name. Um, so there are two modes. This is the mode that I was used to disassemblies being in from long, long ago on line printers, long before any of modern computing back in like the 80s and 70s. You'd have line printers with this junk on it, and that was assembly code. And uh, that's what I thought you had to read. And you can do that with IDA, of course. You can just have page after page of raw assembly code with these commands and try to figure it out, and that is pretty daunting. And the point of IDA is to make that process a little easier by giving you some tools to try to help you. But ultimately, you, the point of IDA is you are now going to really read and understand that assembly code. It is advanced static analysis, where you look at the code and figure out what it's doing without running it. And so one thing to make it easier is to give you this graph mode, where they take the, each routine and put it in a box. And then they have the connection between routines with arrows. So here there's an if statement at the end, a jump not zero. So if it's false, it goes here. And if it's true, it goes there. Here you have an unconditional jump to go down there. And this is the idea to help you group the code. This opens a network socket. This gets input from the user and so on. So you can hopefully uh, quickly get a general idea and zero in on whatever part is of interest to you. Um, so that's the default graph mode display. Um, one thing that is interesting about it is that IDA will automatically add some comments to your code up here. These semicolons are comments, and they are not in the original code, which is compiled assembly code, typically without symbols, so it doesn't contain any comments. But IDA creates comments. It adds a C-type declaration at the top where it tells you what type of arguments go in here anyway, because it can deduce that. And sometimes it, and it tells you what the name, gives them names and some idea of how big they are. So it tries to give you some help by adding some comments to the code, but of course they're really quite limited. And the variables and subroutines typically have awful names like this. They're just named after the location where they're stored, so that's not very helpful. And so one thing you do when really analyzing malware is you figure out that this variable, location 401, is something meaningful like an IP address, and then you right-click and give it a name, like IP1. And then it will automatically put that name everywhere, so that as you figure out what it means, it will become more meaningful. Yeah. Since disassembly sometimes is an art, uh, which disassembler is the most accurate and not worrying about the user interface or which one has the most features? I haven't heard this. Your question is well founded. Disassembly is an approximate process. Um, what I have heard, I don't know from experience, but what I've heard is I just consider one of the best. In terms of most accurate uh, disassembly. IDA seems to be the gold standard for everything, okay. but I don't think it is the most sophisticated at evading deliberate anti-disassembly because just sort of like Internet Explorer, because the standard, when they make an evasion technique, they design it to fool IDA. Uh, uh, so I have not heard of ones that are, are uh, specifically good at punching through anti-disassembly because I don't hear about a lot of real anti-disassembly in practice. It's one of those exotic things like the host protected area and VM escape that you hear about, and there's like a research paper showing it can be done, but I'm not aware of too many real samples doing it. But Probably easier pickings elsewhere. Yeah, it's, it, but it's still, it may come someday. It is technically possible to write code that will not disassemble it correctly, like it's technically possible to write code that will crawl out of the VM. Um, and the question is whether it's really worth any criminals bother to add that feature to their code. Um, is there? And there will probably come a time or a sample when that's true, but um, in simple cases, it's not going to happen. Yeah. 
Does the Ali debug uh, allow you to uh, rename the variables? No, I don't think Ali debug lets you rename the variables. Mm -hmm. It's not intended for this kind of analysis. As far as I know, that doesn't have that feature. However, Ali Debug does have like a Python extension, like Firefox extensions. Mm -hmm. So there are a bunch of extensions you can download, and there might be one that adds features like that. But this is more of a disassembler than a debugger. Right, this is not a debugger. I don't even think you can run code in it. If you can, it's very, uh, I know um, the other one I use, Hopper, has in principle some debugging feature, but it doesn't work very well. That's not, the, I'm the really, having issues with it, so yes, yeah. I would agree with that. Yeah, it's focused, this one's focused on static analysis, and yeah. all these focused on dynamic analysis. Yeah. Anyway, um, so if you go into options general, you may notice something. Um, this, this code here is so condensed, it has just the assembly language, just like push EBP. It does not have the address, and it does not have the raw bytes of the instruction. And that is something I'd normally like to see. This, in my opinion, is trying to make it too simple for me. So if you want to add that stuff back in, you put it in here. Uh, the line prefixes will put the address on the line, and this will put some opcode bytes. So if you do that, then you see this, which I think is better. Here's the address where it's stored. Here's the actual hexadecimal bytes of the instruction. There's the assembly language. That is something I often want to see, because I know I'm, I'm not very happy with assembly code. So very often, I do I look at this for a while, and then I want to go back to just a raw hex editor and see the hex and mess with it there. And I'd like to have this right here to help you do that. Um, but so that's good to be able to find the anchors. Yeah, it's, it's useful depending on how you use this. Yeah. Now, the most common use I have for it is to take a sample and make a tiny little modification to make a challenge for the students. You know? So that's why the simple things I'm doing all right. But if you really want to understand the routines and figure them out, then this is where the action is. And that's why, by default, that's all it shows you. But I'm. You know, I think I came from the world of forensics in the really old days when you didn't have any of these tools and all you really worked raw, from a raw hex or raw memory dumps like this. So I'm used to this. I want to see what's really there. And if you're sort of a physical storage oriented person, you'll want to see that. If you're a logical coding person, you'll just want to see that and not worry about that. Anyway, um, so red means uh, a conditional jump that is not taken in whatever condition it's assuming you have. Green is the one taken. Blue is an unconditional jump. Up means a loop. Something's going to happen over and over again. So there you go. Here's not taken, taken, and blue. And there aren't any up examples there, but you'll, they'll come by now and then when you do something over and over. Um, if, you, all right, if you highlight an EBP here, it will highlight all the other occurrences of EBP around there, because apparently you're interested in what's going on with EBP, and so you probably want that it does everything possible to try to help you. you know, this is like, I read science fiction books, which I think are coming, where kids of the future get that kind of paper book and they say, you know, why don't the letters read when I poke them? Why doesn't they highlight? Why doesn't it give me the definition? How can anybody get anything done on this stupid thing? And you know, I, this is the way, it's a smart reader to try to help you with all these features. We have the story of the little two-year-old who goes up to the TV and starts yeah. touching the TV yeah. and doesn't understand yeah. why things don't react to it. And I don't fault them. They're right. Why doesn't it? There's no good reason. Why? Watch people. They have iPads the size of this monitor now. and you know, That's where we're all going. And if you, it would be better. And you'll think this is just totally primitive, you know? Anyway, um, so here you have... Um, Arrows, these are arrows connecting things, so this is a jump down, and here's another jump down where in certain conditions it'll jump some, it tells you what section you're in. Remember we got text and data and R data and relocation, these various sections. Then you got an address. All Windows programs think they are at 400,000 hex. It's a virtual address. They're actually relocated to all different spaces in memory, but they believe that's where they are, and they refer to everything by those virtual addresses, which are offset by some constant by the operating system. And um, then you've got the real code here, and then you've got these comments, which are also generated by IDA Pro. So here, you pushed some, the, the address of something up on the stack, and then you called a subroutine, and this address pointed to a readable string. So if it points to a string, IDA will tell you what the string is here, success, internet connection, carriage return. So it is going to do something with that string, like put it on the screen, or send it out a network socket, or put it in a log or something. But since I had detected that this offset led to a string, it put the string right there, which is really very helpful. And that's why the general thing I've said all through this class is when you're faced with a screen full of too much data, you start on the right. And they, by tradition, they put the easy stuff on the right, like readable strings, uh, names of routines where you can read the name and things like that. And that's where you get the equivalent of pictures, something you can understand quickly 
not something dense and confusing. And that's really important because you're never going to have time to understand it all, so you have to find some way to quickly figure out this part is boring, 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 this is the good, which I think is a good practice for the world of management. In management, you never have all the facts, you never have all the time. You have to say, this guy's complaining, this problem here, this problem here, the phone is ringing, which one of these things is worth my attention? And uh, that was very hard for me to learn because I came from the world of mathematics and physics where I read a page and make sure I understood 100% of that page before I went to the next page. And that's fine for a technical worker in a finished field, like calculus or something. And it's no good for a manager, a malware analyst, or anybody here where you're going to be skimming through a pile of junk and have to quickly pick out which one matters and ignore all the rest. And just accept that what you're doing is not perfect and you are not going to find it all. Your job is to be good enough to find enough information out of this mess to move forward without spending forever doing it. The same thing's true of forensic examiners trying to find evidence for a case. If, if you're trying to find evidence of a crime on a hard drive, you are not going to find it all. But you don't need to find it all. You need to find enough to prove that the crime happened. And if there was more you didn't find, that doesn't really matter. Anyway, all right. Those are the auto comments. They're on by default. You can turn them off if you don't like them. But uh, typically, they are helping you quite a bit. So that'll put comments. Oh, I guess, I guess it has limited comments. And if you turn that on, you get even more comments. You get a comment on every instruction. And these, I think, are not so useful, like call procedures if I don't know what a call is. That, I think, just gets in the way. I think the default setting is better, where it only puts information there if it's not obvious. Anyway. <coughs> So you also have a bunch of windows, like 15 or 20 windows by default. Um, there's a functions window, which shows you the name of functions, and it labels them here with a code for what they are. L is library, and you could sort by any of these fields. So you could sort to put all the library functions together because you might want to focus on them to find a library that does something you want, or you might want to ignore them because they're code that wasn't written by the user and you don't care about that, or something like that. But you can sort by any of these things. Um, all right. Names is a little more than strings. You also have a strings window, which is the same strings we've been using in bin text, every readable string. But names is more. It's named code and functions and named data, all the labels that are used and all the strings. And these letters tell you something about what they are and tell you where they are. And you can double click them here to go where they're stored. All these things are live. When you find something, you can double click it. It will take you to another view of where that was used. There's the strings, just the same old thing we're used to, just any series of printable ASCII characters longer than a certain length appears here. And at first, they're in the order of where they are, the address in the code, but you can sort by anything else, like string to put them in alphabetical order. One irritating thing is the alphabetical order is sorting by ASCII. So the capital letters come first, then the numbers, and then the lowercase letters. So if you don't know that, it can be confusing as you scroll through the capital letters, don't find what you want and think it's not there. Because um, it is just a dumb sort. It is sorting by the ASCII number. And at ASCII, capital A is 41, and lowercase a is, I think, 61. So you've got imports and exports, just like we've had them in other uh, tools we've used, like um, dependency walker. These are the functions you're using in libraries, and these are the external functions you're providing. And this looks like an EXE, where it imports a bunch of functions, and the only thing it exports is start. So it's an EXE. It's not intended to be called by something else. It's just intended to be started, and then it will use libraries. And you can see the active data structures. If you have done any C++ programming, you've learned about these. In C, you just have to do integer and character and stuff. But in C++, you can define structures, like a data structure with a name that has a string and a pointer and an array and all in one name. And that's what these things are. So you can view the structure. And if you hover over one of these structures, you can then see what's in there. And here's a whole series of things, old DSP, old pointer, handler, SEH pointer, a whole bunch of pointers in one structure. So if you are getting into the programming, that's one category of object you might want to search through. And then there's cross-references. If you double-click a function, you'll jump to the thing in other views. So if I start with reg right string, which is a function name, um, then I could, I don't quite see how it connects to this one. I expected to go to the code that used it. But anyway, if you double-click on something, it'll jump to another view. And we'll be doing it quite a bit live. You'll see how these things go. Remember how functions are called. 
in assembly code. We've been doing this a lot in the 127 class also. When you call a function, it's always like this. You push stuff on the stack with push, push, call. You'll always see a series like that. Um, because when you call it, you enter the function, and then it looks on the stack for the arguments. So before you have a call, you have a push, or sometimes they'll do a move to an address calculated from ESP or EBP, which amounts to the same thing. But they have to put stuff on the stack and then call. So you get used to that. Your arguments are here, and you call it. So this is going to call something called string length, which is going to calculate the length of a string. So I guess one of these is going to have to be a pointer to the string, and I don't know what the other one is. Um, something like the, uh, as I remember, the if it's just a typical C function, the other one will be something like the uh, the place to start, and that would be substring. I don't know why there's two arguments, but apparently there are two arguments for that function. I would think there'd be just one, but there may be a reason for two arguments. Um, all right. Uh, you very often in IDA lose control, make a mess, get lost. There's a back button like a browser, and you can do Windows Reset Desktop to put all the windows back in the default state in case you've been closing windows and the window you need is gone, and Windows Save Desktop to save a view, which, and by the way, to really use IDA, you want to have like two or three huge monitors and a powerful processor, and you know, it's, it's uh, you have all these panes open showing you all these little details, and you're scrolling through this one and seeing this one and figuring it out, you know. Um, all right, so you can double click any entry and it will jump over to the disassembly window and show it to you. So here I am at a string called heap alloc, which looks like a Windows API call. And when I double click it, it will go here and show me where that string is stored. Not where it's used, but where it's stored. In a, um, but it'll be a, an entry there called xref in that line or near it that I can use to the get to the code that's using it, which you don't see here, but we'll see it when we do it live. And there are links. You double click any of these, it'll show you a location. So there's a uh, calling a number, a named address. Call data segment this address. That could be a, a numerical hex address, but here it's got a label. But if I double click it, it'll go to it anyway. And I say forward and back or up there, just like a browser, in case you only make a few steps and you're lost and you're going back a few steps would help you. This thing is really useful and I should, I can confess, I must have used IDA for about a year before I learned what this thing was. It's very useful, and my lack of understanding it held me back. One of the major things that happens with IDA, which is very annoying, is you load a program and it almost always shows you some junk that is useless. It shows you some stub thing with one command that goes nowhere, which is some stage of the early stages of launching the program, not the part that has anything useful in it. And it's hard to find the part that has anything useful in it until you learn about this thing. This thing is a one-dimensional graph of your whole program. This is the start of the file, and this is the end of the file. And it takes IDA maybe 30 seconds to develop this. As you load up IDA, these colors will be slowly changing, and there'll be some text scrolling at the bottom saying processing the file. It's not really ready until the colors stop changing, and the message says all done. And now this, this color is quite useful. Light blue is library code, but dark blue is the most important thing. That dark blue is user written code, which is normally where you're going to find the goodies, the bugs, the strings the user put in there, the flow that you're trying to understand. Um, the other things are like stored constants and stuff. So you can just click here to go there. So if what you're, no, you can just click here or even drag through this, and you'll get a quick zip through the file. And then you can quickly find out which part of it is interesting to me. It has the stuff like C code, like if something equals something, then do this that I can read and understand. Yeah? It's kind of like a, a tool tip, you know, where you just kind of scan yeah. through and it'll give you a little... Uh, no, what happens uh, is uh, when you click on this, it'll appear in the other window, oh. the code there. And you can even drag through it, and then all the code will scroll by. So we'll do it live, and let me show you. In fact, it might be time to just load one up before I talk any more like this. Let's get one up an example here. So here's my... Windows 2008 machine, got IDA in here like everything else. So here's IDA Pro Free. And you say OK. And here's where one of the first things is, this is true of all disassemblers, you don't just load a file. Because it's not going to load a file, it's going to analyze a file to create that disassembly, which is kind of guessing. So you disassemble a new file. And I guess I'll start with the one we're going to use later, which is this one here. I think it's... Um, yeah, labo501.dil, the one I lab from the book. So I'll just open, oops, I hit the wrong one. Um, I'll open it here, labo501.dil is here. All right, 
So when I load it, I get some choices. What kind of file is it? Portable executable MS DOS or binary. It is a portable executable file. Ida will try to see what it is, and it's right. And there are various options for how it's going to disassemble it. So if you had one of these cases where it's actually hiding from the disassembler, you might be able to do some of this to make it disassemble more intelligently, but I've never done anything but the default options. It's complicated enough already. I just accept the usual assumptions when disassembling, and off it goes, and there's the bar, and it's not done yet. It's moving and changing color. It is analyzing, and that's what's going on down here. Now it tells you the initial auto analysis have been completed. It has now been through the whole file and decided what part of it is data, what part of it is commands, and turned them into commands. And now it's showing me a graph overview of the whole file here, which is the same information you see here presented in another way. Yeah? If you click on that little box, does it expand it? Yes. Uh, you can make it bigger. Okay. And you can also use this to move around. This shows, this little frame here shows the current view. So I can drag that frame around and like zoom in, zoom in on that part of it. So this is another way to try to find the code that's interesting. Here's these other windows like names and strings. Now I'm always working on laptops. So my first issue is to get more room on the screen. So I maximize this one and get rid of this log view, which is no longer interesting, and get rid of this thing, which is no longer interesting. All right. Now I've got as much room as I can, and the default view is this thing called graph view, where it gives me boxes of code. If I want to get to the other view, I can click in there and hit space, and that'll take me back to text view. So this is a start. So now typically what I do is go look at strings or functions now to find something that makes sense to me. This is a library file, and in this one, I think the interesting thing we're going to do more of later is functions. I think I'll just do some of it now to show you. If I sort by name, then I get a whole lot of these functions. Here's some recognizable C ones, like mem compare, mem copy, mem set, printf, string cat. Those are good old C calls. I know what they're doing. And the one that we're going to use here is get host by name. If I type G, it'll show me the Gs. It's the capital Gs, though. And if I go down here and hit G again, I think it keeps on going back. That's not going to work, but I can list drag to get down to the rest. And so here's the lowercase s's. And I expected to find a get host by name, but it looks like it's not working for me. Let me just choose another one for right now, and we'll come back to this. Um, here's mem copy. So I'm, I've got mem copy, and if I double click this, it's going to show me where it goes to this mem copy thing. And you'll notice how I've got, I'm in the text section, so this is executable code, and I have cross references over here. And just like before, all this stuff is live. So if I want to see more about this mem copy thing, I can just hover over it, and it will show me some code that uses it. This, in this case, shows me where this variable is stored, where this label is stored. And if I go to the xref, it'll give me an opportunity to jump over to this other code that references it. And that's the game. You can cross-reference, you can jump back and forth, so you can find something interesting, go see what's going on with it elsewhere. All right, and we'll play with this in a little more detail. I got a project where you have some stuff that's somewhat meaningful, where you, de where you find like the command and control center for some malware by tracking down the DNS lookup. All right, G will jump to a location, just like we had this in Ali. Right click, go to label, or go. You can search by all kinds of things. Search by a sequence of bytes, search by a string, search for the next data, search for the next code, of course, because you're very often lost and you have to find your way up, past all this junk to the good stuff again. Um, and I mentioned cross references. You can just hover over things and it'll pop a box showing you where this thing is used. So here I have the start of a, a procedure called CDECL, and if I hover over this, it'll show me where it was called from. Um, it only shows you a couple cross-references by default. You can press Control-X to get a chart of them all, all the places this thing is used, um, or, or X. All right, and there's data cross-references. So if you go to a strings and you start with the data cross-reference, you can go and find where the data is stored. And we're going to do this live a little bit later. Um, all right, let me just mention functions. Item will identify the function and name it and name the variables. Like I said, notice now that he's putting an address on every line, notice how these lines make sense, 1044, 1045, 1049, but these are all the same. Now that is not true. These are the comments. 
They don't really have zero size. They don't really exist in the code. And instead of just leaving this blank, which might have made more sense to me, it just repeats the first name over and over. You may not have noticed it, but this is also true of um, Mona, the tool we use in Ollie in 127 class. I think we haven't used it here because it's a tool. But it has a place where it makes a layout that has a hex address that doesn't mean anything, and it just fills them all with bad food. Bad food, bad food. You know. It's fairly common that they fill this with junk when they don't know what to put there, and that's what this 1040 junk is. The real, the 1040 real addresses are down here, and that's why I'd be happier if it was showing me the bytes there to remind me of what part of this actually contains bytes and what part of it is just a dummy value. Anyway, um, there's graphing options, which I find have never done me any good. Um, these are attempts to somehow graph some portion of it in a different way. There's like five ways to do it. Function calls, xref to, xref from, and I find them mostly baffling. Um, Flowchart and function calls seem to be obsolete. And xrefs2 will show you the cross-references that get to this function. So one thing I thought was kind of fun is I did this in, window, in calc.exe, the Microsoft calculator. And the only thing I got out of this is it calls something called check Windows genuine status, which makes me feel like they actually, Microsoft considered making calculator not work if you didn't have a license key. I don't think they actually implemented that, but it's in the code. This is like if you read the news articles, we'll often talk about a patent filing. Apple filed a patent to like see through the wall and send you a different ad depending on what room you're in. They said, Apple's going to invade your privacy. And probably what Apple's going to do is decide that's not such a good idea. But you know, there, I, clearly at some point, somebody thought of tying the you know, function of calculators to your Windows activation status. Um, anyway, here's cross refs from. So you get to see uh, from check Windows genuine status, you get to see where it goes after that and you might be able to try to figure out what it's doing. So these are one possible way to get someplace in the code. Haven't done me any good, but I haven't done that much in-depth IDA stuff. And then there's another xref chart that shows you more. Anyway, um, so there's, you can enhance your disassembly, like I said, but if there is no undo for this stuff, so if you mess things up, you gotta start over. Uh, you can rename locations, like I said. You can take some name like sub for a 1000 and give it another name. Of course, it, there's no, it has no way to know if you're right. And you could do something like name a bunch of them all the same name and make a mess of your code. So you can't tell them apart anymore. So you got to be careful. And I would, whenever there's no undo, I always save version 1, version 2, version 3, version 4 to make my own undo, the old days. I got used to doing all this long, long ago before there was undo. So I always got, had a naming system. One, two, three, four, five, because I often find on number five that I've been doing it wrong since number two. So throw that away and go back to number two. That's the way it is. <laughs> That's why you know, a guy comes in and says you made a terrible mistake, and I say, well, you know, we all do. <laughs> That's life. There are too many things going on, you can't get them all right. Anyway, so I hear they're going to manipulate things. So here you've got var 598 and arg 4, and over here you've figured out that var 598 is a port number and arg4 is the port number is a string. So you can relabel it in one place and it'll label it everywhere else. And as long as that's true, you're helping yourself understand things. If it's wrong, you're helping yourself get more confused, but Ida's doing what it can to help you. You can add comments with a colon or a semicolon. A colon will put it in one line and a semicolon will then echo that comment to all cross-references to this point too, so that your mistake will be magnified. Um, and you can format things. It's going to show you everything in hex, but if you'd rather see it in base 10 or something, you can right-click and choose a different presentation of that static number. That's true of almost all these tools. Um, and you can use named constants. So before symbolic constants, I send a 3, a 0, and a 1. But after symbolic constants, I know this is file attribute normal, open, existing, null, because I know which API it's calling. And um, then I put the official Microsoft names on them. And you can get plugins for IDA, just like for Ollie, just like for Firefox, just like for Chrome. There's a community writing more plugins to do things like decrypt things and find format string vulnerabilities and so on. Um, in both assembly code and C code, format string vulnerabilities are quite easy to find. That's just where something is printed without a format string, so it's pretty easy to find a certain kind of print statement that doesn't have two arguments when it should. Um, so. It's surprising how this vulnerability persists when it would be so easy to stop, but that's true of most of them. Um, all right. So I think I'll do some cahoots, and then I'll just demonstrate a couple of projects. Get you guys started. Let me find my cahoots here. 
So, which feature shows instructions in little boxes connected by arrows? Okay, that's graph mode, they call it. All right. Which one shows user-written code as dark blue lines? Okay, that's navigation band, that bar. Little line is some, dark blue line is user-written code. All right, what kind of code cannot be assembled with the free version? Disassembled with the free version. <clears throat> yep, 64-bit, good. All right, how do you get from graph mode to text mode? All right, spacebar will do it. And how do you move to a specific hexadecimal address? That's G. All right. So here's my winners. Let me bring up my project and let's uh, go through a couple of these demonstrations of IDA. So here's the first one. All right, and there's only one lab in the book on IDA, and this goes through about the first one third of that lab is all. So it's a DIL, labo501.dil, which we've already opened and we already looked at this stuff. And um, let's start with the graph mode options, which I didn't do. Notice if I hit spacebar and go back to here, you notice this is the default view where all I get is the assembly code and the comments, nothing else. And you can try using it that way, but I feel lost if I don't see nice hexadecimal numbers to make me feel like I know what I'm doing. So it's options general, line prefixes. We'll put in those numbers, and here's the number of opcode bytes, and something like six there will be enough for most instructions. Now I have the address and the raw bytes, and then this stuff. And up here, it's the same number over and over because that's the dummy, and these are the automatic things put in by IDA. And again, here I am, some stupid part of the code, which is useless, something called thunk, which I always see in the header early part of every function. And I don't know what it is, and I don't really care. It's some part of what Windows does to launch a program. The goodies are somewhere else. So, um, all right, I could get there with this bar. If I drag through this bar, you zip through the code. Here's the user-generated text code, which shows up in those boxes. The part that is no longer blue is going to be stored data. This is apparently strings being stored, or funny looking strings, but anyway, data of some kind being stored here, data binary. Then over here, I've got this brown stuff, which looks like uh, pointers, the library routines. Then I got this gray stuff, looks like more pointers, and then I'm gone. All this black doesn't really have anything in it. So that's my choice. This is one way to move around. The dark blue is the good stuff if I want to see code. All right, yeah? You say there's a light blue somewhere? There is a light blue, but I'm not seeing much of it. Light blue would be library code, and apparently we don't have any of that here, or not enough to see. You don't always have everything in every sample. Is this sky, sky blue? Yeah, yeah. All right, so let's see. The next thing is text mode. We've seen that. Okay, so let's find get host by name. It's a Windows API function that does a DNS lookup. So if we want to find a command and control center, that's probably going to involve calling that function. So that's the game here. So we're going to look at the imports function. Now, if you maximize the main window, Ida view A, which is what I recommend, then all the other windows just show up as tabs here, which is pretty convenient. So I don't close them. I maximize it, and they're all there. If you somehow lose them, you can go up to view or windows and get them back. And you can, here's where you can reload the desktop to get, in fact, let me do that. I'll load the desktop to get back to the default view. Whoops, cancel, uh, reset desktop. Yeah, reset desktop. There, this is the default view with this crazy thing in front and this thing and all this jazz. So I sh just to repeat, when you first see IDA, I don't think this is useful. I want to get rid of the junk. I get rid of this thing, which I never use. I get rid of this thing, which I don't care about, and get more room here. And then I get maximize this thing. I could close those. That's what I used to do. Now I realize it's better to just maximize this, and they'll go into tabs. Because functions and strings are pretty useful, especially strings, because I know exactly what it is. And functions, which is very similar to strings. So functions, well, somewhere in this mess, will be get host by name. So if I sort by name and get to the lowercase letters, that's S-T-W. So up here should be G. When I looked earlier, I didn't find it. 
and I'm again not finding it, so something has fallen off the track here. Um, it's got a, oh, it's have a symbol in front of it or something? No, it's just supposed to be right there. After F right, get host by name H Tons. I have the address here, so I can use that if it continues to irritate me. Um, and it looks like I'm going to have to do it because it's seriously not showing up there. And I don't know why, but there's all, I don't see any addresses here at all, so I think something is seriously wrong. What's going on here? These are functions, these are strings. Oh, maybe I got to use strings. Oh, I should be using functions. Uh, oh, imports. Ah, that string does not appear in the code. It's the name of the library function. What appears in the code is some kind of pointer. Okay, I'm in the wrong window. Good. Then I feel less crazy. Imports is the window I should be in. Let's go there. Okay, now this looks better. These things are in order of them being in the um, in order in which they appear. Now they're alphabetical. So the uppercase letters are here, and the lowercase letters are here. And now I got F right and get host by name. Good. Now th and those are typical Windows API calls. So if I click on that, it's get host by name. If I hit X or Control X, I think. Nope, not here. Okay, double click it. That will take me to a place where it is stored. So the cursor is in this line, and here is the call to get host by name. So I can highlight that. Maybe I hit X here. Yeah, there's where you hit. Now if you highlight that and hit X, now it will show you every place that is used. Call get host by name is used nine times. So there are nine places where it does a DNS lookup. And I could now double click them to examine them one by one and figure out which one is interesting. And I'm going to just um, save time by telling you it's the third one from the bottom that turns out to be the one that calls the command and control center. So I, we're going to go there. So I double click the third one from the bottom. And now I get to the code that does that. So it pushes a pointer to a name on the stack and then it calls get host by name. Now, if I want to learn more about what happens here, I can hover over that and it'll refer back to where I came from. And let me go back to my instructions and see where I want to go next. So I did that. I went here. So there's an address called off 100 And if I double click it, it will show me the data that's stored there. So this is the, it moved the address of this variable into EAX. Then it added 13 to it. And then it put that value on the stack. So the actual domain name is stored at this location after 13 bytes of stuff it skipped over. So if I double click that address, it'll show me that stuff. And that is down here. And this is what's stored there. This is one view of it. It's showing you the data segment. This offset points to a place. And here's the stuff that's stored there, the beginning first 20 letters of it or so. Bracket, this is RDO, pics.practical malware analysis, so on. So that pics.practical malware analysis is going to be the domain name. And if I want to get there, I go to the xref here. Uh, let's, let me get my, um, you go to hex view A, right. If I just go to hex view A from here, double click that, that gets me to this location. And hex view A, that's what shows me what's stored in this location is an address 10.01.91.94. And I can see 91, I'm 91.40, 91.94 is down here, um, 91. 94 is here. It's starting with blue. These are ASCII values, and here it is. This is RDO, pics.practicalmalwareanalysis.com. That is the domain name of the command and control center. And this stuff before it in square brackets is some kind of label, which it skipped over and did not pass that through to do the domain resolution. So I've now found the, a meaningful indicator of compromise here, the uh, domain name. And I could look on my network for these DNS lookups and find the infected hosts. So it's useful. Of course, I haven't really proven all that, but I've done, now if I just took strings like bin text and I found this string, which we did much earlier, I could guess that this might be the command and control center, but I'm not really sure. Now, if I did dynamic analysis and I saw the traffic in Wireshark, I'd have much higher degree of confidence that that's the command and control center. Here, I found the actual DNS lookup. I could now read the code around it and decide under what conditions does it do this. And hopefully I'd find something like a timer that sends this out every 30 seconds or something of that nature. So I haven't really proven exactly what it does here, but I have proven that it is a real domain name and it's used for real domain name lookup. 
by the code under some conditions. And this is just a little bit of information that you're getting in much more detail with much more labor from static analysis. And this is why you try to avoid this static analysis as much as possible, because you work really hard for a little tiny grain of information. But sometimes you have to do this. So here's another one. This is, in fact, a botnet command and control standard, and it gives the criminal the ability to execute command line commands on your system. So it does that by calling uh, cmd slash c. That's how you do it. If you want it to open a command prompt, do something, you do cmd slash c. So we're going to, if you just look through the strings, you'll find this, and we can find the code that uses cmd.c. So let's go here back to strings. And these strings are right now in the order in which they appear, and that's not very useful, so I'm going to put them in um, sorted order. So now it's going to start with funny symbols, and in fact it's going to be backslash backslash cmd.c is what I'm looking for, and that's going to turn out to be after all the capital letters but before the small letters. So here's all the capital letters, and... A w, okay, now I'm getting, this is the end of WXYZ, now I'm down to these funny, by the way, this one should look familiar, that's the command and control center we just looked at. One thing that I thought is kind of fun is the textbook tells you it's going to be practical marijuana analysis, but the real sample has it misspelled, which the author doesn't seem to know, which is kind of funny, which makes me think there was probably an earlier version of these samples when he wrote the book and then something was modified. It's easy to have that happen. But anyway, there it is. This is command.exe slash c. So this string is used to execute command line commands. So I would like to see what's going on where that string is used. So I double click this, and that takes me to where that string is stored in hex view. <coughs> now I think I want to go back to Ida view because now I'll have this xref, and that'll show me the code that uses it. And I can double click that to go to that code, and now it's going to show me the box of code in graph view, which is showing me it's now going to push the offset command.exe slash c and then call some routine, or it's going to push this one, which is command.exe slash c. Now, if you know your windows, this is 16-bit command line, and this is 32-bit command line. If you remember good old Windows 95, Windows 98, they used to be command. So what's, and if you look up here, it calls get system directory, get startup info. These are Windows API calls to figure out what kind of what version of Windows you have. So it does these calls to figure out if you have 16 or 32-bit Windows, and then it calls the appropriate one of these based on that if statement. So this is really looking like what I said it was, remote control, where the criminal is passing up. So someplace up here, it's got a string variable that contains a command from the criminal, which is added after this to form the full command line, which is executed later. So if you just look around here, you'll probably find other things that are used to communicate with the criminal. And if you just scroll up a bit and ignore everything and look for things you can read, here's a carriage return line feed. I look for the gray stuff on the right. Here is high master. So, you know, here we, and to start a welcome or something. So this shows that uh, this is some kind of greeting message that they get when they control their bots. And this is very common for botnets. You have a master control panel that says, I have 1,000 Windows machines in the USA. I have 10,000 Windows 98 machines in the Ukraine. And I can these, these ones doing that, these ones doing that. And they're all sending uh, messages to inform you they're online and how fast they are. And you can just give them commands. So this is typical stuff you'll see. So that, again, we've, we've made some progress figuring out what this thing does with static analysis. And that's all I wanted to show you. And, I just want to point you to the next project, which is much simpler, because it's just simple CTF stuff I found, IDA Pro challenges. These things are crack me's, and they're a good little way to get started with IDA Pro. So the, they're, they're called, I wrote them myself based on some stuff I saw in a user's group. So I put them in a root a folder called IDA here. And I called them a crack me-121.1 because they were in a one, so unit 121 long ago. So, if I just run it, crack me, 121.1, it's going to give you the usage message, which is you're supposed to give it the name of the program followed by a password. So if you do that and put in a password of ABC, it tells you fail. And apparently there is some password that would make it say win, and that's the goal of this. This is very, the simplest kind of crack me you'll find in every exploit training. And so uh, if you want to find the password, there are many ways to do it. You could just do it with strings. 
You could do it lots of ways, but we're going to do it by looking at it in IDA as a case, a real simple case to examine it in IDA. So this crackme.exe, you can load it in IDA the same way. I've got it here. I'm not going to save my old database, which is not the default. IDA thinks I'm going to spend a week analyzing one sample and save all my comments, but I'm not doing anything like that, so I'm not saving the database. I'll take all the defaults, and uh, it has debug information. I'm just going to say no to make it faster because the debug information doesn't help me. So here we are. Like I said, IDA always does this for some stupid reason. It shows me some garbage called thunk. One of these days, when I feel like it, I'll Google what the hell thunk is. But whatever it is, I wish it, Ida wouldn't show it to me every time it's launching something, because it's not helpful. But anyway, um, now I can find the real code a lot of ways. I could click in this stuff and drag through and try to find real code. But since I ran it, that was my recon, I found some strings that were interesting. So I'm going to use strings. Let's maximize this. And see, right here I have fail, you found the password. So this is the part I want to do the code near there, so it's easy. So I double click a string of interest, and that will take me to this, and that is Ida view, and if I press, I can't, oh, that's showing me where that string is stored. So here's the string like that says fail. Here's the cross reference to the string. If I hover over that, it shows me the code that uses it. If I double click, it goes to that code, and now I'm able to totally see what's happening here, and again, I really don't have to read the assembly code very much. Um, here's where it starts. This is the preamble that sets up the stack. We go through it in the 127 class. In this class, it doesn't really matter, but this is just uh, setting aside room for local variables. Here it defines some local variable, which contains the string top secret. Here, and then it takes something and compares it to that string. It calls some subroutine. I don't know what it does, but I can guess it takes user input. Or to be more exact, it harvests the first parameter from the command line. And then it compares two things, and one of them is this string called top secret. And if, it's, and if the comparison goes one way, it says you found it. If it goes the other way, it's going to go over here and print fail. So obviously, the password is top secret. And that's what I mean. You can pretty much just read it by looking at nothing more than the arrows and the strings for very simple programs like this. And in the project, I have the original C code and show you exactly which one of these boxes. Each one of these boxes is like one or two lines of C. This is an if statement. If password equals top secret, then do this. It goes this way or that way. And you know, uh, so you should get used to understanding what C structures look like in assembly. That's how you read it. You recognize patterns that mean something sensible. So apparently the answer is top secret. And so that would be crack me top secret. And now you win. So that's the joy of simple crack me's in Ida, and there's, these are based exactly in difficulty and kind on ones I did for the, um, for the uh, an international malware analysis workshop I did years ago, the Honeynet Alliance. And um, so there's four of them that keep getting harder and harder. So, and you can get them all with Ida Pro, of course, but they each one want to imagine a few more, a little more confusion. And um, so they're worth extra credit as you do these. Uh, and I was a real wimp. I never learned how to compile C worth a damn on Windows using Visual Studio. So if you, do, if you don't know what you're doing, it needs this stupid dill you don't have, so I just put the dill there. This is totally unprofessional. There are better ways to do it, but I didn't know them. Anyway, um, so there's a whole series of crack me's, and when you crack them, uh, you can get extra credit. All right, and that, that'll give you a little bit of practice with IDA. may not make you an expert at all, but it'll hopefully make you so you're slightly better than just lost in IDA. And that's as far as we're going to go into IDA in this class. And so next week, we will, um, uh, I think this class does not get a week off. This is, I'm right, next week, yeah, next week we're going to talk more about recognizing C code constructs in assembly. And then uh, we'll get down to kernel debugging in a couple weeks. The kernel debugging projects are already up. I put them up. It's a lot of fun. So there's enough projects to keep you out of trouble for a while. All the projects for the whole month of October are up. And they're only going to add maybe two more for the whole class here. If I come up with anything else, it'll be extra credit. So any questions about anything? OK, I'm just going to clean up and go up to the lab. I'll help anybody with Science 214 for a while.